Hi everyone, welcome to lecture guide number 10, Baroque painting in the Netherlands and France. So before we get started, let's recap what some of the stylistics are that we expect to find in the Baroque period. Um, number one, remember we said there's an increased interest in naturalism. Uh, naturalism as opposed to the idealism of the preceding classical period in the Italian Renaissance in particular. And naturalism is basically believable figures in believable space. Number two, uh, there's a careful reinterpretation of classical ideas and classical precedents. Number three and number four, which are closely related, there's a renewed interest in emotional qualities in painting, both the representation of emotions, but also getting the viewer caught up in the emotional qualities of the painting or the subject. And number four, an inclusion of the viewer in the space of the painting or making the viewer feel engaged or a participant in the painting in a way that is different from the Renaissance idea of a window in which the viewer is a kind of silent voyeur witnessing a scene. So we're moving on this week to look at the Baroque painting of the Netherlands uh, and France. Now, before we get started with the Netherlands or Holland, um, it's worth saying that in this part of the world, farther up north, the traditions are much more closely aligned with those that we saw in the Northern Renaissance, starting in Flanders and then looking at the work that was in Germany uh, and all the way up into uh, Flanders and the Netherlands, again, during the Northern Renaissance period. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, these works are much more naturalistic even than the works that you saw of Caravaggio or the Italians. And part of this, as you'll see with our first artist, has to do with the difference in the context. The Netherlands were a fairly small uh, grouping of various nations that became incredibly wealthy during the 16th century in particular through trade. And this wealth was a lot more widely distributed than the wealth that you saw when we were talking about the middle class in Italy, which is basically kind of, you know, incredibly rich people. In the Netherlands, um, you know, we have people that are much like what we might find in contemporary society, an upper middle class that was much broader in its base than the things that we find in Italy. And that has an important effect on the art because the people that are commissioning the works of art, the patrons for the works of art, are often people that are not extremely wealthy necessarily, and the types of works of art that they want to have uh, are a little bit, you know, for lack of a better word, lowbrow by comparison. So, of oh, that lecture guide, make sure you have that handy in front of you. This first artist that we're looking at is Franz Halls. Franz Halls, in this work that you see before you, is the Jolly Topper, or loosely translated, that means the merry drinker. Franz Halls got famous for painting uh, portraits of people in a very kind of lowbrow way. These are portraits, as you can see here, in which the person who is having their portrait done, the sitter, is not so concerned with showing off their opulent wealth or their learning. Uh, they don't accompany themselves with you know, lots of symbols uh, of their wealth, as for instance, we saw in the Arnolfini devil portrait. Instead, these are kind of upper middle class people that are interested in a portrait that captures their likeness. It looks like them to some degree, but also gives a sense of their um, of their personality. And in this case, the Jolly Topper is an upper middle class person who clearly likes to have some beer on occasion. He seems to be very friendly. He's greeting us with his hands raised and a kind of, uh, you know, smile on his face, ready for a, a conversation. Now, yes, to be sure, the clothing that he's wearing, 
the hat that's slightly tipped back are all symbolic of his station. He is a little bit more wealthy than, let's say, the standard middle class or lower class people of his time. This hat tipped back on his head says that he is not one for grand formalities, um, but he is to some degree fashionable. But the real kind of thing that we find in Franz Hall's work that is so important in the history of art, and I'll show you this more when we look at the next painting and I can show you close-ups of it, is that Franz Hall's painted in a really quick, what's called painterly style. He uh, didn't try to create a photographic likeness of his characters. You can see the brush strokes. They look like they're rapidly applied, and he doesn't try to hide that to any degree. It increases the spontaneity of the picture, both in the sense that you look at it and you think this was rapidly done, but it also gives you a sense of a figure that is in movement, a figure that's not so interested in formalities, and so forth. Um, my favorite portrait of Ron Tall's is this work called Molly Baba. Now, we know that Molly Baba was a real person, uh, that she was uh, described uh, in the popular press as, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be offensive here, but this is the quote, as kind of a half village idiot, half witch. She may have had, you know, some kind of mental disability. We're not sure. She may have just been an eccentric. Uh, we don't know much more about her than that. Um, as you can see here, uh, you know, once again, it's a very informal portrait. She's cackling away. Um, this beer stein that she has in her right hand would be, um, let's say, uh, admired and coveted by the most kind of proficient beer drinkers of today. She seems to have some kind of bird, maybe a small owl on her shoulder. Um, it's likely that she's one of those people who wandered around town with an owl, although it's also possible that the artist has just included this in order to give you a sense of this, this woman who is thought of as, um, you know, a little bit eccentric here. But the real kind of key to this work is when you get up to it, you look at the way that it's painted, look at all these rapid brush strokes that you see everywhere. He's not trying to make a photographic likeness. It was said that he could create a portrait within a couple of days, and that seems quite likely here. Um, and these types of works of art in which the artist rapidly applies painting, but from, let's say, five feet away, it looks very, very realistic, will be something that in, let's say, the Impressionist period of the 19th century, many modern artists will look back upon and draw from as their precedents. Major artist in the Netherlands, in Holland, uh, during this time period, of course, is Rembrandt van Rijn. Uh, Rembrandt had a really interesting career. He came from a family from Leiden who discouraged him from going into the art of painting because they thought it was below his station. He was the first of the children of this family to actually attend university, but he decided to go into the arts. Early on, at the beginning of his career, he gets very popular, primarily through portraiture and then larger scale commissions. But by mid-career, when the styles had changed and a lot of the younger generation uh, was interested in new styles, no one's buying his work. And because he wasn't very good with money, he actually goes bankrupt. And we have accurate records of a sheriff's sale in which they auctioned off all of the contents of his home, including all of the props that he had collected to help him create his paintings. He had collected ancient armor and swords and um, lots of uh, taxidermy derm animals and, um, you know, textiles and just about everything. Now, this younger generation, we, we won't go into this much, we're kind of the second generation of wealth in Holland. There's a mass explosion at the beginning of the 17th century of wealth due to the trade routes. And this younger generation basically inherited the wealth from their parents and wasn't interested in the old styles that were attached to Protestant beliefs and so forth and wanted more flamboyant things. So they didn't buy Rembrandt's work, although they bought a lot of his students' works. The first work that I start, start us off with is a subject we haven't looked at before in this class, 
This is called Bathsheba with King David's Letter. It's a wonderful work of art that runs counter to the tradition of the female nude in a lot of different ways, particularly the work of Titian. And again, I will remind you that this uh, article that you read by John Berger, Ways of Seeing, uh, is really helpful for us thinking about some of the subtleties of the difference between the representations of female nudity. So let's start with the subject matter here, because we haven't talked about it before. You know who King David is, but Bathsheba is a new subject for you. After King David, before he's king, of course, slays Goliath, he will go on to become king of the Israelites. And um, and as king, he's kind of in charge of uh, the palaces in Jerusalem. Uh, while his armies are out holding uh, at bay the various forces that want to do harm to the Israelites. Now, while he's in his palace, he comes across this beautiful woman who lives in the palace who happens to be married to one of his most powerful generals, Uriah, and her name is Bathsheba. Now, he is smitten by her, totally overwhelmed by her beauty, and eventually what he'll do is call her to meet with him by giving her a letter. And that's probably the letter that you're meant to be seeing here. Although as the story goes along, you'll find out there's another letter, and anyone looking at this work would have thought of both letters that Bathsheba uh, received during this story. So King David and Bathsheba have an adulterous relationship. Now, remember, this is Old Testament, and King David, although an incredibly important king, um, is shown doing something that is, of course, against the values of his religious belief system. And certainly, as you know, things progress, and now we live in the Christian age under Rembrandt, it would have been seen as you know bad form, uh, sinfulness to of course, have an adulterous relationship with someone, especially if this person happens to be the wife of one of your most important generals. So as the story goes along, they have their relationship, they consummate it. Uh, eventually, Bathsheba becomes pregnant, and now David is in a bind because everyone knows that Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, has not been in the palace so she must have gotten pregnant by someone else. Who could that be? So in order to cover up the fact that he is the likely culprit, King David decides the best course of action is to call Uriah back from the front. And of course, because this man has been out in the field for so long, he'll want to see his wife. And then they can pass off the pregnancy on this reunion. However, Uriah, being so morally upstanding, when he is called back to the palace, refuses to enter the palace walls, saying to King David, it's not fair for me to come see my wife when all of my soldiers are still out in the field. It's, it's just not something that I'm going to do. Now, you can imagine uh, King David's uh, reaction to this, right? Oh, my God, I can't believe this guy. Um, but now he's left in another bind. So what is he going to do? When Uriah goes back to the front, King David does another horrible thing in this story. He sends Uriah to a very um, dangerous battle where he's bound to be put in grave jeopardy. And Uriah perishes in that battle, thus leaving Bathsheba a widow and King David marries her. Now, in the biblical story, the child that is born uh, of this adulterous union actually dies in uh, very quickly after birth or is stillborn. And this is understood as a sign from God or a kind of punishment from God. And later on, King David and Bathsheba actually have another child, a very famous king, King Solomon the Wise, who I referenced when we were looking at the Merode altarpiece because King Solomon the Wise's throne had lions and lion's feet on it. In any case, let's look at this picture now that we know the story. The way that King David came across Bathsheba over and again is in his tours of the palace, he would see Bathsheba going to the baths. Now the baths, as I said last time with Suzanne and the elders in the Old Testament, are not just a way to get one's body clean. They're seen as an almost symbolic ritual purification of the body and was often something that women did 
following their menstrual cycle, their menses. So now in the story as well, Bathsheba is not completely innocent. It's not just King David being lascivious. She likes him in return. And she begins to um, time her trips to the baths for the very time that King David will be out surveying his palace. So what we see here, returning to the painting, is Bathsheba. She's received the letter. She's Her maidservant is washing her feet, which is a symbol of humility. And she seems to be pondering what her course of action will be. Will she submit to this illicit affair? Will she, uh, you know, turn it down? What is she going to do? And as I said before, there's another letter in this story that people would have thought about when Uriah actually perishes, when he dies at the front, she receives a letter uh, telling her of the fate of her husband. And so, in a way, someone viewing this would have thought there's a letter from King David, but remember later on, there's this horrible letter informing her of the consequences of her actions and those of King David. Now, what makes this so different than other female nudes are, number one, if you look at this female body, it looks quite realistic. It looks like a real woman's body, not an airbrushed, idealized, you know, eroticized female body. It just seems to be a body that doesn't have any clothes on. But even more importantly, and this is where I'm turning, it's a naked body. Because when we look at this body, we think about her thoughts and her feelings and her desires. She's actually showing some emotion here and she's contemplating something. And this makes us empathize with her. So unlike the nude that lends itself to the objectification of the female body, this makes us see a female body, but see it as a, a person, you know, someone who lives and has feelings and thoughts of their own that we have to take account of here. You think of this it would be another pretty good compare and contrast essay, right? And to prepare for these things, just start thinking about what is different about Titian's Venus of Urbino versus Rembrandt's Bathsheba with the letter from King David. Said uh, Rembrandt got famous uh, primarily through portraiture, and his portraits are, I think, unlike anything that you see ever have seen before in the history of art. They are full of human emotion. They're full of tenderness. They're painted, and I don't spend a lot of time on this because you can't see it very well in a reproduction. They're painted in a style that really emphasizes the material qualities of paint on a surface with lots of textures and lots of kind of rich uh, lighting and so forth. This work is called uh, The Jewish Bride, although it's not entirely clear who these people are. It's likely a husband and wife. We know that Rembrandt had a huge uh, following of the Jewish community uh, in Holland. And if this is a Jewish couple, uh, what we see here is a very tenor, uh, tender interaction between husband and wife. It's not a formal portrait. We don't have a kind of, if you're familiar with these portraits, a hierarchy with the husband is sitting in the chair and the wife is standing behind him at his side. We don't have a lot of emblems about who they are. All we have is this tender, inter tender interaction where the glances of each and the touching gesture of the husband's hand on his wife's breast and her hand reaching up to his hand is what is emphasized in this picture. This is out of place chron chronologically with the um, with Rembrandt's career. I wanted to show you this work here um, before we go any farther to look at the major work of art that I'll be spending my time on. But this is the return of the prodigal son. One of the things that Rembrandt is best known for, besides these brilliant lighting schemes in which the light actually, unlike a Caravaggio, although it's very similar, seems to actually emanate from the figures themselves rather than being a spotlight on the figures. But even more important than that, Rembrandt's known for pictures that create empathy in us. They're very subtle emotions, but when you look at these pictures, you really feel the emotion that he's trying to purvey through the picture. The story of the prodigal son is once again an Old Testament story, and it's a moralizing story. The brief version of this story is that um, in Jewish society, 
it was very common practice to give uh, the eldest sons their inheritance before the father died so that they could go out and kind of start their lives, right, um, rather than waiting till the end. And in this story, the eldest son and the youngest son are given their inheritance. And the eldest son, who you see over here on the far right, standing tallest, does everything right with his money, right? In, he invests in blue chip stocks or something like that. He's very frugal with his money. Does exactly what you're supposed to be doing with your inheritance, putting it to work for you to make a good life. The younger son, however, goes out and blows all his money on fun and entertainment and drinking and so forth, so much so that very soon he is reduced to a destitute situation. He doesn't have any money anymore, and eventually he returns to his father and begs him for forgiveness for blowing all the money and asks for, you know, uh, asks for his love. Now, in other representations of the scene, you almost always see a scene in which the father is on one side and the son is on the other, and they're kind of looking at each other, and maybe there's some gesture of forgiveness uh, from the father here, but nothing like this composition had been done before that I'm aware of. In this one, it's almost like you are walking into the scene with the prodigal son, and the prodigal son who's here in the foreground clearly is reduced to an incredibly destitute situation. Look at his clothing, it's all, you know, thread-worn and ragged and dirty. Um, his shoes are literally falling off of his feet. His hair has been completely shorn off because this is this would have been um, an indication that he had gotten some kind of pest, lice or fleas or something like that, and had to, to, to shave off all of his hair. But the real emphasis is placed on the father. The father and his forgiveness of the son reaching over to embrace the very humble son who's sitting on his knees and all of the light of the picture shines on the father's face or emanates from his head as if to say symbolically to forgive is divine. This is the proper way to um, to greet someone who is truly repentant about their sins. Now, this fits in with a very important Protestant belief system in the North, Calvinism. Um, John Calvin was a, a major minister and theologian, and we're not going into all the ins and outs of his thinking, but one of the big things that Calvin emphasized was that every single person, regardless of their sins, can always be redeemed. This was a big idea for Protestants in general. Remember, Originally, Martin Luther had broken with the Catholic Church on the grounds that indulgences seemed to suggest that the Catholic Church or the Pope could dispense uh, redemption or grace, when that's only God that can do this. So this is a big theme for Calvinism, the idea of redemption. Now, looking almost down his nose, you know, he looks a little, he's taller than everyone else. He's certainly kind of moderately grumpy about the fact that the young younger brother has uh, blown all his money and done everything wrong and still is going to be forgiven. The older um, son, while looking a little bit grumpy about this, still seems to recognize that this is the proper way to respond, as does everyone else in the picture. Rembrandt's self-portraits, which he did throughout his entire career, are quite interesting. Um, with a very, very kind of subtle way about him, he is able to give you an indication of who he is and how things are going for him in his life without filling up the picture with accoutrement, with little symbols of this or that, or with clothing. The way he appeals to us is by capturing very naturalistically the emotions on his face, the expressions, the lines around his eyes, the staring glance, the turn of his mouth, and so forth. Well, I can't be sure every time I look at a Rembrandt portrait, and I've seen dozens of these over my life, I'm absolutely convinced that I know exactly what this man was thinking at the time that he painted this work of art. Get up close on some of these pictures too, you'll see that the way that Rembrandt painted 
is what call is what is called impasto painting. It's a very thick paint application to the surface that doesn't try to hide the brush strokes and adds a lot of texture quality to the painting. This is uh, again something that I bring up in Art 128 or the next iteration of the survey of uh, or history of art. In that Rembrandt, like many other artists, and you've seen this in Halls and you've seen this in Velasquez wants to, um, and if you've seen a lot of paintings, you know how pleasurable this is. He wants us to, on the one hand, recognize this as a likeness of himself. But when we get up close, he wants to show you the material qualities of paint, texture and color and form. Um, he wants you to take pleasure in those things as well as the skill that he has in making it a likeness of himself. One of Rembrandt's most famous pictures is the so-called Night Watch. Uh, it was called the Night Watch because before it was cleaned, it looked like a night scene. It is, however, an early morning scene. And it's really called Captain Banning Cock mustering his company here. And the subject is, this is a group portrait again. Just like Velasquez's work, Rembrandt and the Baroque artists were at pains to create more interesting group portraits. And the group portrait here is actually of the Textiles Guild in Amsterdam, uh, who were also militia members, basically fighting off the Spanish. Um, these people could have been in that scene that we saw by Velazquez of the surrender at Breda. They didn't actually see battle, however, they're just kind of play acting in a way for their uh, group portrait. Now, as a militia, these are citizen soldiers, right? And so one of the things they want to emphasize is that they're willing to sacrifice their lives, their livelihood for the betterment of everyone around them. And the other thing they want to emphasize, and this is the part of the composition that is most interesting, is that they will be doing their everyday activities, but when called to arms, they will arm themselves and go out and fight. And what I mean by that, and its relation to the composition, is in the background, everybody just seems to be milling around. And every one of these faces you see is actually a portrait of someone who is a member of this textiles guild and Captain Banning Cox uh, militia. They're all milling around. They're actually musketeers. So you see different symbols of various stages of loading and firing a musket. This guy's loading it over here. Uh, and this guy's blowing out the ash after firing, firing it. And there's other things in here as well. But they're all milling around until, and you can probably just start to make this out, Banningcock and his lieutenant are starting to lead the people out of the space, and one gets the sense that they will all fall in line behind him. Now, one of the most interesting components of this work that a lot of people have speculated on its meaning happens to be this little figure all aglow in the background. Um, she is probably, and again, all the things that your text says about this are likely true as well, but she's likely the person that they're fighting for, a young, innocent girl who's returning from market with a chicken underneath her belt here. The chicken prominently displays the claws, which is probably, and you'll read this in your text, a pun on the name of the militia group, and it may even be a pun on the name of the leader, Cock, here. Um, but more than that, she is the person that they're fighting for. The work that I want to spend the most time on, however, <clears throat> is this work called The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp. What we see here is a group portrait of the Surgeons Guild of Amsterdam. I'm going to pause here for a minute, and uh, you'll see very little, but I'll be right back. So you have a special topics reading, a reserve reading, all about this work of art. And I will cover some of the bases here, but a lot more information will be found in that reading. Um, so as I said before, this is a, another group portrait of the Amsterdam Surgeons Guild with Nicholas Tulp 
performing what was known as an anatomy lesson. One of the reasons I spend so much time on this work is that it gives you a pretty good idea of the context of the period in which, on the one hand, we have the old traditional conventional beliefs of religion kind of running uh, into the newly emerging belief systems and um, preoccupations of the Enlightenment period. The Enlightenment, which you'll read about in your textbook, and as I've mentioned before, is the period that we have inherited in our modern age. It's the period of scientific investigation, testing hypotheses, knowing as much as we can about the world in which we live. It's kind of an extension of humanism uh, that gets much more kind of rationalized during this period. And one of the things, of course, that scientists were interested in was the human body, how it worked, how to heal it, and so forth. However, and this is where the two kind of the religious side and the enlightenment side run into each other, um, the the church, whether it be Protestant or Catholic, believed that the body housed the soul and that it was bad to desecrate a human body after death because one didn't know how long that soul stayed within the human body. And if you ruin the house of the soul, um, you might condemn that person's soul to everlasting damnation or limbo or something of the sort. So you can imagine a kind of scenario unfolding like this. The new sciences, including studies of the human body, wanted to study the human body to know how it worked. But the church would say to them, listen, you're going to damn this person to hell if you perform dissections on a human body, uh, or at least you might. Uh, what do you say to that? And the sciences came up with a pretty ingenious kind of uh, counter argument, which was, well, haven't you always said that we're made in God's image? And isn't it likely that we're made in God's image both inside and outside? Whereas the emphasis that had always been placed on the exterior of the human body, remember the idealization of the body in the Renaissance period, uh, during this period, scientists argued that the complexities of the human body, you know, and anyone who's ever kind of studied the human body and the brain and so forth knows how complex it is, was an indication of God inside of us. And so what they argued is that by knowing ourselves, both inside and out, we could have a greater understanding both of the way that we work and how to heal us and so forth but also a greater indication of God, God's order, God's complexity. And the, the church said, well, great, but how do you still deal with the fact that you might desecrate a human body and condemn someone's soul to everlasting damnation or limbo? And a bargain was kind of struck. And that bargain was that the only people that were allowed to have anatomy lessons or dissections done on them were condemned criminals, people who were considered to be sinners and thus couldn't be redeemed. Um, and this, this kind of policy uh, was in effect during the time period in which this work was created. Only people that had been executed for crimes could be the subjects of dissections. Now, what were these dissections? Well, the dissections took place in the Netherlands during the winter months because, of course, during winter, a human body could be preserved more than it could, let's say, in the summer. Human remains, of course, start to spoil pretty quickly upon death. And in those winter months, a dissection would take place in public. There were outdoor amphitheaters where in the front seats, other surgeons would sit to learn from the person performing the anatomy lesson but anyone could attend. There were cheap seats in the back where anyone could attend and just look at this whole thing uh, and either through, you know, their own kind of morbid curiosity or for their own scientific understanding, see these things unfold. This is an accurate representation of a specific anatomy lesson to some degree, not entirely. The people that you see in this picture are all portraits of the Amsterdam Surgeons Guild. 
And the person who's having the anatomy lesson performed on them, the dead person in the foreground, is a man named Eris Kint. That was his nickname, Eris the Kid. He was called that because he was stunted. Uh, he was kind of almost a dwarf figure who had been convicted and sentenced to death for the crime of assault and theft. He, he knocked down a wealthy person and stole their cloak during the winter months in the Netherlands where it's very, very cold. And this was his second offense. And so he's condemned to be uh, executed. After he was killed, the anatomy lesson is performed. But here's where the symbolism of this work really gets going. So stay with me. If you've ever watched a show on dissections of bodies or if you've been in a biology class and performed a dissection, either on a human body or another cadaver, you'll know that the standard procedure is to cut a giant Y cut uh, through the abdomen up into the chest and go in and look at the organs first. And that practice was in effect during this time period. So the question is, why is the leader of the Amsterdam Surgeons Guild, Nicholas Tulp, cutting into the forearm and the hand of this figure, right? Because this isn't the way it would have been done. And the answer for this is it's totally symbolic. The thing that makes us closest to God, of course, is our human hands with the opposing thumb. On Michelangelo's uh, creation of man, it's God's hand and Adam's hand that almost touch each other. So this is a way for the artist, and it was probably worked out with the Amsterdam Surgeons Guild, to emphasize the idea that by knowing ourselves, we know God. Here's the closest thing to God, our hand. And so by dissecting the hand, it is emphasizing that. But there's another two reasons for this. One of them is that the most famous surgeon who was practicing almost a century before this, who I've mentioned before, Andreas Vesalius, who worked in the court of Charles V of Spain uh, during the period of basically the High Renaissance, uh, created the first extensive manuscript on dissections. And on its cover, in its front page, it showed the, the surgeon Andreas Vesalius dissecting a human body and what he was doing was going in through the hand and the forearm for the same reasons that I've given you. In other words, what this surgeon is saying to you is that I am like Andreas Vesalius, who was the most famous surgeon of his time. The final reason that you might go in through the hand is that it's well known that it's very, very difficult to flay the hand and the forearm without disrupting the muscles and the tendons that control the hand. And, and so this is showing his skill. Now he's reaching down there with forceps to manipulate those flexor tendons so as to move the hand in and out and show how the hand actually works. Another symbolism is up here in the foreground is a book. That book in the up lower uh, right hand side is probably probably Andreas Vesalius's text. Right behind Nicholas Tulp is a shell niche. Remember what we said about shells, they're symbols of purification or baptism. And this is likely what is known as the triumph of science over sin thematic. It's meant to say that by putting to use the sinner, Andreas, uh, in this case, Nicholas Tulp is redeeming, in a sense, that sinner, making him useful, purifying his sins in his own way. Now, with all of that being said, there are a whole host of things that are going on in this work that seem to suggest Rembrandt's uneasiness with this procedure. And what I mean by that, you'll find in the reading, is that Rembrandt was a Calvinist. He was deeply empathetic to humankind. He oftentimes created even prints for the lowest class people. Um, he cared about them. And as I said before, Calvinists believe that no one is beyond redemption, even the greatest sinner, and especially not someone whose only sin was theft and assault. So is Rembrandt saying in this work, and I'm not going to tell you all the reasons that this interpretation that you have in your reading gets to this proposition. You'll have to do that reading on your own. Uh, 
is uh, is this work kind of subtly coded? Is there a kind of subtext to this work that shows Rembrandt's uneasiness with the idea that sinners can't be redeemed and therefore they are the only people that you can perform anatomy lessons on? The enigmatic artist of this time period is Jan Vermeer. He was uh, almost an amateur artist. Um, there are only a little over 30 works today that are accurately um, understood to be his work. Um, and he, you know, there's movies that have been uh, made about him. The Girl with the Pearl Earring, for instance, uh, is about him. Uh, he got popular among a small group of patrons uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands by creating these, these gorgeous little works that are full of beautiful luminosity on everyday subjects tied to religious themes. What you're looking at here is a work that's called Woman Holding a Balance. Uh, Woman Holding a Balance, like all of uh, this man's work, was probably created with the help of a camera obscura, which is a type of uh, camera that isn't, you know, they, they didn't know at this time how to fix the image. But any kind of pinhole camera can project the image of whatever you point that camera at on a glass surface so that you can use it to copy it. And this probably aided him in his work. The subject of woman holding a balance is a woman basically set up as a vanitas picture. She's holding in her hands a balance dead center in the middle of the work. And what she's balancing symbolically is her material aspirations, her one of wealth and a nice house and a comfortable living with her aspirations to do well by God and to achieve everlasting life in heaven. Now, the symbolism for this is on the one hand, really straightforward, and on the other hand, very complex, and has to do with the way that the artist sets up the composition or arrangement of things in the work of art itself. The woman herself looks suspiciously like a Virgin Mary figure, although she is not. Behind her head, hanging on the wall, is a painting of the last judgment scene. So about religion and about being judged at the end of days, uh, on the basis of your good and bad acts, uh, whether you've been a sinful person, whether you've been someone who has, um, you know, repented your sins and so forth. Kind of kitty corner to that, uh, on access to that painting is a box full of precious materials, coins and jewels and pearls and rich fabrics and so forth. And so it's that weighing of one's material aspirations against one's spiritual pursuits. But if you go further than this, it gets even more complex. The composition is very asymmetrical, isn't it? On the right-hand side, there's a lot of stuff going on, a woman and a painting. On the left-hand side, there's a lot of stuff on the table kind of balancing things out, and then an emptiness of the wall and the light of the window shining through. This is on purpose. The light that is barely shining through this window and illuminating the wall would have been understood as the light of God. And so it's a balancing of the material stuff. A painting is actually something that you buy, that you purchase, that is has monetary value against the absence of things, asceticism, the light of God, and religiosity. And that balancing gets really, really interesting. Up here in the top upper area, again, just off center, is a little nail that's been pounded into the wall. And next to that nail, right off to the side of it, is a little hole in the wall. Now, anyone who's ever hung a picture knows exactly what this means. You know, you hang it once and it's not quite in the right place, so you pull that nail out and you move it over and you hang it again until you get it balanced in the room the way you want it. And this nice little anecdote is about balancing again. I'll show you a close-up of this because this is where the camera obscura comes in. As I said before, and you can look this up, and you may have done this in science class in high school, if you just poke a hole in a box that is closed from the light, light actually enters through that aperture and will project 
inverted, upside down, an image of whatever you pointed at. And if you get a lens on that, you can actually um, focus that image so as to get a really accurate representation. The camera obscura used a, a box like that, but the light would shine in and bounce off a mirror and then go up onto a plane of glass. And artists began to use these things to help them to paint. The reason we think that this artist used the camera obscura is that what a camera obscura does with very bright highlights is it turns them into these little blobs of white. And all those little blobs look a heck of a lot like what you would find if you're looking at an image of a woman on a camera obscura. Um, said before in the Baroque period, you know, there's a lot of everyday subject matter, genre scenes, naturalistic scenes, and this is one of them, although it does have a moralizing quality to it. This is Jean Vermeer's Soldier and Laughing Girl. Soldier and Laughing Girl shows a man in the foreground with his back turned towards us talking to a young lady. In the background is a map and next to him in his hat is an open window. Now, the, at first glance, you would just think this is a conversation between a man and a woman and not think much more of it. But as you look more closely and if you think of the values of the time, you'll realize that this woman is in a bit of jeopardy here. She is doing something that is considered incredibly flirtatious at the time. She's smiling at him with open lips. And now I know today you wouldn't think much of this, but this is crazy flirtatious. It would be like today someone, you know, is pulling off their shirt or something. She's one step away from being seduced. And the reason she's being seduced is encoded in this work of art. Number one, it's clearly the middle of the day because of the light in the scene, and she is drinking already. The guy has gotten her drinking already. The guy that is doing the talking and seducing her is dressed as a rake. He is a man who is not to be trusted. He's got flamboyant clothes on, his hat is tilted off at an angle, and he's got all the right lines to convince her into, you know, let's say, compromising her moral values. What he's probably kind of charming her with are stories about his travels. And the reason we think that is notice how the map in the background, which is actually a map of uh, the Netherlands, uh, is shown. And then these maps, by the way, are constantly changing during the time and people are decorating their homes with these beautiful maps showing the new world and so forth. Um, that would indicate the thematic of someone traveling. Also, the window is open right next to him suggesting that he's been out in the world and traveling around and can convince her of all these stories and seduce her into doing something that she shouldn't be doing. Vermeer's famous works these days, primarily because of the movie in which Scarlett Johansson played this character, um, and by the way, that movie is mainly speculation, um, is this beautiful work. There's nothing that I have to say about this. We don't think that this is Jean Vermeer's lover that he's picturing here. After all, where would he hide this picture? You know, it's a very, very religious society. He can't just paint a picture of his lover and, and kind of, you know, get away with it. But it is clearly a flirtatious, beautiful young woman turning to look at us. She's dressed in a turban, which is to make her look even more exotic. And of course, it's just this beautiful, beautiful picture um, that is meant to be flirtatious. Now, what I always like to point out is that even though she is beautiful, one of the things that's most beautiful about this picture are the colors and the textures of the fabrics around her and the redness of her lips and the kind of green blue of her eyes. Now, later artists of the modern period will say, wow, this is beautiful, but do we really need a face? Maybe we could create beauty just using line and color and shape and texture rather than making this a portrait. Briefly, I wanted to show you this work. This is Jan Vermeer's The Allegory of the Art of Painting. It is, a, in a way, a self-portrait of Jan Vermeer at work painting. And what he's painting is a scene in his studio uh, in which what we see before us is a muse. This is one of the Greek muses, Cleo, the muse of history. And what Jan Vermeer is trying to say, and we see the, the typical Baroque curtain pulled away, 
is that art is a process in which we use models, but we draw upon history in order to inspire us to our great creativity. So now let's turn to France for a bit. And um, I'm going to jump forward here. Let's start with artists. Let's, I'm sorry, George de la Tour. Uh, George de la Tour uh, painted uh, in the typical style of the, he's in France, but he's painting in a way that looks very Northern Renaissance. It's during the Baroque period, but what I mean by that is that he takes religious subjects and paints them in a way that are understandable to the masses. He kind of shows you these subjects from the standpoint uh, of human characters in religious situations. So that in this case, for instance, what you're looking at is a work that's called The Education of the Virgin. Now, we've never seen this before. We tend to come across the Virgin Mary at the age of 14, uh, receiving the Annunciation from the angel Gabriel. And at 14, she already looks like a very mature woman who knows how to read and isn't surprised at all uh, by the task that God has sent for her. But remember in the Northern Renaissance, um, you know, a lot of artists tried to pitch religious subjects in a very contemporary way. And this is common. Um, and this is something that during the Baroque period, George Latour continues in his own work. We're witnessing the Virgin Mary learning how to read. We see her as a young girl who actually had to be educated. On the one hand, what this emphasizes is the importance of literacy, which was becoming ever more common during this time period. People were learning to read. The printing presses have been developed so as to allow people to read. We're also witnessing the idea of the Virgin Mary being a real human being that has to be educated. She didn't just kind of pop into the world, and know everything, and that mom, St. Anne here, has to help her out. What we're also seeing, though, are characters who are typically represented to look like French people. Very common in religious painting, right? Um, the patrician nose on uh, St. Anne here, that long nose there is very typically French, as are the pursed lips that are common in French portraiture here. So it's making them look like French characters. Now, along with that, here's some other things that I can give you. Very common in Dilator's work is the use of this lighting scheme, a single candle in the center of the picture or roughly in the center of the picture that illuminates the scene from the inside out. Oftentimes, that candle is juxtaposed against a hand, uh, usually the most religious person in the work of art, and that, that candle kind of glows through the hand, making it seem almost immaterial, like it's a like she's more spirit than she is human, or that she has this kind of spiritual quality to her. The lighting also illuminates the character who is considered to be the most religious more than it illuminates anything else in the scene. So if you look at the Virgin Mary's face, it is the most illuminated and St. Anne's a little less so. Now, again, very kind of ordinary. Look at her stick her little finger out to follow along uh, with the lines in the, the text here and how her lips are pursed because she's saying this all out loud. That's a very kind of genre way or ordinary way to represent a kid learning to read. Now, there's some other symbolism here. In the background, you see very prominently displayed a wicker basket. This references the fact that the Virgin Mary and St. Anne would have been, on the one hand, in charge of domestic duties. It's like a laundry basket. But in France at this time, and even today, wicker baskets oftentimes are used as bassinets to hold children. And so that wicker basket in the background is symbolic of her future. She will give birth to a very important child, Jesus Christ. But then also notice how that wicker basket casts this really prominent shadow behind the figures. Nothing else casts a shadow here. That casts a shadow. Remember, shadows are the absence of light and usually represent death. So we've got the Alpha Omega here, the birth and the death of Christ that will unfold in this story. Now, finally, something that was told to me by a French national and is, uh, you know, a really uh, complex form of this, this symbolism, 
is that the candle that she holds in her hand is very clearly a wax candle, not a tallow candle. A tallow candle is made out of a animal fats, and wax candles are made out, either out of beeswax or paraffin wax and, and things of that sort. And the difference between those is the amount of cost that goes into each. Uh, tallow uh, candles are pretty cheap, but they sputter and they stink, and they're not very useful for reading. Whereas wax candles give a more even illumination, but they're more expensive. Now, the reason I bring this up is to say that the education of the Virgin Mary is important enough that they're willing to spend on a wax candle here. Let's look at another one of these. The work of the childhood of Jesus. It's called um, St. Joseph the Carpenter. And what we see here is a father and son interaction, a very genre scene from the early life of Christ, something that people could empathize with. How many fathers have taught their sons their own trade? So Joseph, of course, was a carpenter and he's hard at work doing his, his daily work where Jesus shows up and is talking to him. Now, in the scene, once again, we have the typical George Latour candle. We've got the hand that's been illuminated. We've got the increased luminosity on the face of Christ to make sure that we understand he's even more important than Joseph, right? One of the things that's curious about this work is that it looks like Christ is doing all the talking with his you know, feet up here as if he's testing out ideas or even teaching Joseph rather than the other way around. And the, the other symbolism of this is that uh, Joseph's actually drilling a hole in what looks like a, a four by four, but that, that big uh, piece of wood would have referenced, of course, the cross, as does the form of the auger bit here, which has a crossing member and the vertical member, so as to make us think about the future of Jesus being crucified or sacrificing himself on the cross. The most common uh, subjects of George Latour's work is this one. A Mary Magdalene. Usually these things are called the Pentatent Magdalene or the Repentant Magdalene. These are scenes of Mary Magdalene after the death of Christ, where she becomes an ascetic and devotes the rest of her life to contemplating the will of God. The work is a beautiful Magdalene figure, once again looking typically French, once again with little indications of her earlier life. There's an exposed shoulder and a little bit of cleavage uh, showing here to reference the idea of her being a fallen woman who has repented her sins and followed Christ's life. On the other side, across from her beauty, of course, are symbols of the memento mori. In the foreground here is a skull sitting on probably a Bible, typical symbol of a reminder of death. And over here is what's known as a reliquary, which we've talked about before. In this case, it seems to hold another skull. These are symbols of death and a reminder to keep your, uh, your attention focused on the spiritual realm rather than just your material pursuits. Now we're going to back up for our last artist of the quarter here. We're going to look at the work of Nicholas Poussin. Poussin uh, was a much more prominent artist during his time period. This is a work that's called The Rape of the Sabine Women, and I'll come back to this in a minute. It takes a little bit of a setup here for Nicholas Poussin, and um, the reason I spend some time on him has more to do with the establishment of something known as the French Royal Academy to the Arts, during his lifetime and during the reign of Louis XIV, the so-called Sun King, the king who, um, you know, was constantly embattled with his aristocracy, who was instrumental, he's the grandson of Mary de' Medici, by the way, um, instrumental in establishing France as the cultural center of Western Europe. Before this time period, and there's a reason we haven't talked about French arts very much, France wasn't particularly important in the arts. Italy and Spain and Germany and the Netherlands and certainly Flanders were important, but France hasn't done much. Um, before Louis XIV actually takes control uh, of the throne, uh, when he is actually, his kingdom is being ruled by regents, the French Royal Academy to the Arts is started, uh, but he will foster this academy. You have a little reading by Nicholas Poussin on what great art should be, 
Um, but before we get to that, let me tell you what the French Royal Academy was. The French Royal Academy was, on the one hand, a teaching organization that was administered to by the French state. They paid money and streamlined the education of young painters and sculptors or engravers on standard techniques of painting. This is different than the guild system or someone apprenticing to a master artist in that you could go to a central kind of state-sponsored school to understand artistry. Now, teaching took two forms. One of it was standard technique, right? How do you draw? How do you paint? What? How do you do these things? And, you know, at this time, you couldn't just run down to Daniel Smith and grab your art material. So you had to know how to grind pigments and mix pigments and prepare panels and, and all of that stuff. So teaching the skills was one thing. But the other big thing that the French Royal Academy did, and again, this French Royal Academy will start in the 1630s, but continue all the way to the present day. It's still around. It's known as the Ecole des Beaux-Arts um, and continue to be very important all the way through the 19th century, at least. That French Royal Academy also taught about the aesthetic philosophy of great art, right? And we've covered this before. You've got a reading by Nicholas Poussin, the inaugural address of the Royal Academy, in which he says, great art has to have these four things, right? Number one, all great art must start off with a grand subject matter, something that is full of a lot of human import, lots of moralizing lessons, and so forth. If you start with a scene that is like just a female nude or a flower picture, or a landscape, you can never be really a great artist. You have to pick a subject that is grand, full of a lot of human gravitas. Number two, all great subjects have within them a profound concept or moral lesson to them. And all work of art has to be unified around this central concept. Everything in the picture should be in the service of that concept. Now, if both of these things sound suspiciously classical, they are. Nicholas Poussin was, among the Baroque artists, very, very classically inclined. He loved idealization. He loved uh, very organized compositions. The only thing he adds that makes it Baroque is a lot of dynamic movement in his work and theatricality, but otherwise, they're very classical works of art. Now, what is this concept again? Well, think of it this way. I've used this metaphor before, but if you're writing an argumentative paper, you have to have a thesis and everything in that paper should be in the service or support that thesis. The thesis in my metaphor is the same as a painting's concept. Number three, he goes on to say that all works of art have to be um, organized according to nature. But what he means by that, you know, their, their basic kind of organizational method, um, is that, he uses nature with a capital N, is that idea that we first, you know, greeted with Aristotle, that there is an organization in nature beneath the appearance of things, or that God put, and this is the way Poussin's thinking of it, God created the universe, he created the world with some kind of divine organizational principle in the world, and that the artist's job is to represent paintings that reveal that order or organization in the world. And then number four, less important, is all artists of genius will have their own personal style, their own way of doing things. So let's return to this, oh, before I go on, I should say, that along with teaching the skills, along with teaching the aesthetic philosophy in art, the Royal Academy also had had giant exhibitions to the arts. And when the court of France moves away from the Palace of the Louvre, which is in the heart of Paris, and moves out to Versailles, the Louvre starts to be the main exhibition venue for these giant exhibitions to the art that happen every two or three years. They were called the Grand Salon. And uh, the reason that this is important is that every artist all around Europe started submitting their works more and more frequently to these exhibitions uh, to get them shown. And you didn't just get anything shown, they would be submitted and a jury of other great artists and you know cultural aficionados would look at those works and say, 
yep, these ones should come in. Nope, those aren't good enough. And it would be juried there and then they'd be hung on the wall. And then once they were hung on the wall, that same set of jurors would look at these works again and assign prizes to the works, including the coveted Prix de Rome, the prize of Rome, in which young artists would receive this award and they would get an all expense paid trip to Rome for five years to continue their education or um, you know, other prizes there. And all these prizes were based upon the subjects of art. So here, what we see before us is, for instance, a history painting. Other works were uh, nudes. Other works were landscape painting genres or still life paintings or portraits. But the most esteemed of all these subjects was history painting. So now on to the specifics of this painting. The subject here, the rape of the Sabine women, uh, is a subject that comes straight out of ancient classical Greece. The stories go that there was a moment in time in which the Romans didn't have enough women to continue to populate Rome. And there was no way to get more women, of course, other than doing something rather questionable morally. And that thing that they did was to invite their neighbors, the Albans, over for a big party. And uh, I'm sorry, the Sabines over for a big party. And once the Sabines showed up, they got them liquored up and they uh, started a, a fight with them and stole their wives and their daughters so as to perpetuate the Roman culture. Now, if you're wondering, wait a minute here, why is this subject, uh, you know, something that a Christian would want to represent? Well, I think the moral lesson behind this is that what we're witnessing in this subject, a very famous Roman subject, is the importance of choosing the lesser of two evils. Roman culture, of course, had a profound effect on Western Europe. It, of course, had a profound effect on the spread of Christianity in the fourth century. Would you give all that up? Or is it okay to do something that is a questionable act so as to allow for the greater good? Now, with that being said, that so what we've got here is a grand subject something taken out of classical stories. We've got a profound moral lesson or a concept, the lesser of two evils. We've got the typical structure of a classical work of art. It's very, very highly organized. Let me just point some of this out. Right in the foreground, in the negative space between these figures, you have a big pyramidal form. Everything's set up on axis here on a diagonal rather than the classical type of, uh, you know, uh, horizontal and vertical, but it's still very tightly organized. You have a systematic kind of separation of foreground, the battle scene, middle ground where the architecture is, and background, the deep depths of the atmospheric perspective of the mountains. You have a lot of rhyming of forms, don't you? Look at the arm here and the arm here and the sword here and another arm over here and then the counter thrust of another sword over here. So everything is very tightly organized, isn't it? And then finally, very classical, you see the nude body in the foreground, totally idealized. Every one of these bodies is based upon a systematic canon of proportions. You see these female forms who are being uh, abducted here. They look suspiciously like Greek or Roman sculptures in the way that that nose goes. Remember, I told you about that nose. A bit easier to see these ideas at work is this famous work by Nicholas Poussin called Rape, I'm sorry, Et in Arcadio Ego. Um, that title in Latin loosely translated means something like, I too once lived in Arcadia, which is another way of saying something like, I too was once alive and lived in the beautiful world that you live in, but now I'm dead. So what is the profound subject matter here? Well, it's about human mortality, the fact that we're all going to die. And by extension, in a Christian society, it's about the idea of performing well during one's life so as to attain grace and everlasting life in heaven. What could be more profound than that, right? Number two, remember on this list of things that Poussin says is so important, that concept. What is the concept? Do well in the world so that you can attain everlasting life. Number three, strict organization of the subject matter. We've got a foreground, then a middle ground, and a deep background again. 
we've got a very, very clear focal point in this work. Look at how this works, right? We see the woman in the foreground who looks like she's probably a muse, inspiration. She looks like a Greek sculpture, helping out these shepherds to understand what they're reading on the exterior of this sarcophagus. And she looks towards it. They all look towards it, except for this guy, but they all point to it again. So the implied lines point us into the focal point, which is this verbiage at in Arcadia Ego. Also, though, on the exterior of this, remember how I just said that light means life and God and the shadow means death. Look at how his shadow is cast on this tomb. I'm alive now, but I will be dead. What does that mean? What should I be focusing on for my life? Briefly here, um, a final work for this quarter. This is Landscape with St. John on Patmos. St. John of Patmos was the man who by this time was understood to have written the book of Revelation, the book about the second coming of Jesus Christ, who in the last judgment will weigh all of our souls. So what we're looking at here is a very religious subject where St. John is you know, writing the book of Revelation. The reason that I bring this one in is just to show you that even in a work that looks willy-nilly, as if there is no organization to it, there is a very tightly organized picture. In the foreground, prominently displayed, the only really bright color is St. John. He's going to grab our attention, isn't he? We're going to look at him, and then we're going to look at all these ruins around him that are indicators of you know, past ages that have come and gone, but also of the end of days where everything will be destroyed. In the deep middle ground, you see, uh, you know, landscape, life unfolding, the creation of God that's very, very balanced. Over on this side, it's really dark, but over here in the middle, it's light and then balanced with another dark here, light over here up by the uh, background of the um, architecture balanced by dark over here. By the way, the architecture back here shows an obelisk, which is another symbol of death. It's mem uh, a memorial to death. Okay, well, that's it uh, for our lectures for this quarter. I hope you've enjoyed uh, all the subject, and I hope to see a few of you back next quarter. Uh, do well on your quizzes. I look forward to reading them.